Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to, some suggested I review the Beatles films. Uh, although we don't have Let It Be officially released yet. Uh, but I'm going to start off by reviewing the others, starting with Mystery Tour, which wasn't really a film in, in terms of, it wasn't a movie at the cinema. It was released on TV in the UK, broadcast on December the 26th, 1967, in black and white then repeated on BBC Two in the UK on the 5th of January 68 in colour. Uh, didn't see a release in the US uh, at the time. I think maybe it was shown at some festival or something in 68 and then it was shown in 74 in selected cinemas. Um, and then again in 2012 when this DVD came out. I think it was again shown in selected cinemas around the world, although it was only 53 minutes long. I was just reading that Monty Python considered having it as a, as a trailer for their Holy Grail film in 75, which would have been interesting. And I think they, they went as far as to get permission, but then decided not to, not to do it. Um, so as we, this is the Beatles' third movie, if you can call it a movie, it's only 53 minutes long, so it's longer than an album, but it's not long enough to warrant a, a cinema release. Uh, it got horrendously savaged by the critics at the time. Uh, they called it self-indulgent. Uh, they, they said it had a poor script, if any script. I don't think it really did have a script at all. Um, and it was a bit of a shock, because it was the first time anything had been criticised more or less, across the board anyway, by the critics. The public was similarly a little bit bemused. I mean, it came out, everyone talks about how it was broadcast in black and white and it should have been in color. But at the time of this thing coming out, there were only 20,000 color TV sets in the UK. So you either, I was just watching series three of The Crown, so I know the royal family were amongst people who had color TV in the 60s the late 60s, but most households didn't. So the Beatles should have known that even though they made it in colour, the vast majority of people were not going to see it in colour. And hence, it doesn't really work in black and white. Not that I've tried to watch it in black and white, mind you. Um, but having said that, I don't think we can blame the, the success of this TV film on the fact, colour, black and white or otherwise, because after all, Hard Day's Night had come out solely in black and white and had been a complete triumph. Um, admittedly, health, help the cinema was a breath of fresh air in terms of the colour there. Um, but I don't think necessarily black and white means unwatchable, because Hard Day's Night is possibly the greatest Beatles film, objectively speaking. Um, so that's interesting. Um, hindsight displays a rather more favourable light for Magical Mystery Tour, and people have kind of called it a cult movie. Um, it's interesting, Paul McCartney, nice little booklet with this DVD, which comes with lots of, lots of extras. So he says, uh, having been involved in feature films such as Hard Day's Night and Help, the Beatles wanted to make a film that was in keeping with the spirit of the times. So in the summer of 67, we came up with a scenario that would keep the project extremely freewheeling. At the time, Richard Lester, the director of our t first two films, was quoted in Rolling Stone as saying, they should make that next film themselves, just the way they make an album. I mean, it should grow organically rather than having the professional cult of filmmaking superimposed upon it. Well, it's more or less what happened. Uh, they came up with some ideas and went with it and did their own production, wrote their own words, ad-libbed ad, ad the script. So Paul continues, I, would, I took over most of the responsibility of pulling this together. We remembered mystery tours from when we were growing up in Liverpool where we would take people on a bus trip without them knowing the ultimate destination. So that's what we did. We wrote a basic story outline, starting with a hand-drawn pie chart, recorded some songs, engaged some likely-looking actors, and along with a few friends, set off in our highly coloured bus heading towards the south coast of England, southwest coast of England. Uh, so, 
And this is the pie chart that Paul's referring to. So it started off as a blank circle, and then Paul just divided it up into segments. And you, the re writing's a bit small for you to read it, but it, it has already this draft has, you know, the recruit, the, the look boarding the bus, the recruitment sergeant, um, the fool on the hill song, um, has the stripper sequence, the dream sequence, and the end song. So I think they all came up with ideas, and th this booklet is fascinating. This is them, Beatles rehearsing Your Mother Should Know in their non-white suit clothes. Uh, we've got various extras here included on this DVD. We've got traffic performing. Here we go around the Melbury, Melbury Bush, which was supposed to be in the film, didn't make the cut. We've got Ivor Cutler singing I'm, I'm Going in a Field, a song which is quite amusing which was cut. We've got an additional dream sequence, which was cut. Uh, and the, there's commentary, just like you get DVD commentaries on you know, your shows like The Sopranos. Paul has done a DVD commentary for this Mystery Tour DVD, where he talks all the way through it about his thoughts. And, his, and I remember him. one of his comments was, I see we're all smoking there. Well, I wouldn't recommend that to the younger generation. Um, and then lots of footage of the Beatles on location for mystery tours, such as going into the fish and chip shop and eating fish and chips and staying at the hotel and dancing with the locals. Lots of nice stories in various books over the years. Um, and I rewatched the film the other day. This is the EP, the British EP I have. Same as the album, the American album, but uh, just the first side of that, the songs. And uh, it did come with the lyrics, but my copy doesn't have the lyrics, unfortunately. I've got a mono copy of the vinyl, by the way, which I'm just very happy to pick up. Uh, so I watched the film on Saturday morning, and it was a while since I'd seen it, and there were some interesting bits, good bits, and not so good bits. Um, firstly, to say that Jolly Jimmy Johnson, the courier, is played by Derek Royal, and if you look carefully, the uh, episode of Faulty Towers where the, the, the uh, guest arrives and is not feeling well and goes up to bed with a newspaper for the morning and then is found dead in the morning, that, that episode with the dead body. That's the same actor playing Jolly J Julie Johnson, Derek Royal, and we've got Ivor Cutler playing Buster Blood Vessel, who was a Scottish comedian, and uh, the extras on here show him He'd come to the attention of the Beatles through his work on TV in the mid-60s. Quite a dry sense of humour, as is displayed in the film. Uh, uh, the fat woman, Jessie Robbins, uh, Ringo's aunt, is shown playing drums on one of the outtakes in the, on this DVD, which was quite interesting. Ringo and Paul are in the documentary of make, the making of Mystery Tour, and they're both very complimentary about the whole thing. Um, and Ringo is saying, yeah, well, we just, we ad lib the arguments between him and his aunt. And Paul concludes his introduction here. It turned out to be a wacky, impromptu romp that puzzled a few people at the time. But as the years have gone by, it now stands as a fond rem reminder of that period in our lives. Um, I was going to say, John Lennon on US radio in the mid-70s, mid 74, I think it was, introduced a track from Mystery Tour saying this is from Magical Mystery Tour which is one of my favourites as it's so weird. I think he liked the concept, he's quite complimentary, he's been quite complimentary about it as being quite ahead of its time. Uh, George Harrison admitted in the anthology that at least it got us out doing things together after the death of Brian Epstein. So, um, so as I say, and Carr and Tyler in their book after giving a r rather derogatory review of the album, finished the review with no one liked the film either. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's not a masterpiece, that's for sure. Uh, but let me tell, tell you what I did enjoy it. I did enjoy the Fool on the Hill sequence, which Paul recorded near Nice in France. Apparently he forgot his passport when he went over to do that and broke a few union rules on the way, I think. Um, I like the recruiting sergeant, Victor Spinetti, who'd been in plays with, of John Lennon's work in his own right in the, in the mid-late 60s. 
Um, I like the flying sequence. If you look to your right, the view is not very interesting. Ah, but if you look to your left, again, in, in black and white, that probably looked rubbish, but in color it looks good, although that footage apparently was nicked from a Kubrick movie. Uh, the marathon sequence where they're all driving around the track, and Ringo apparently is almost driving the coach on two wheels. Um, it's just po a pointless sequence, and I don't know why they did that. It's, uh, it goes nowhere not one of the best sequences of the film. But the I'm the Walrus sequence filmed in, the, in that same area, um, West Malling in Kent, uh, with the big walls to protect the planes from the bombs from the Second World War, which are no longer there. Uh, that's just a fantastic sequence, uh, probably the best in the movie. Um, I like the labor laboratory sequence with the magicians. Uh, where's the bus? Where's the bus, says Ringo. The bus is 10 miles north on the Dewsbury Road, says Paul. And then John hilariously comes in saying, I was half an hour looking for the sugar. Uh, so that's pretty funny. I like those sequences. Uh, the love scene between uh, Ivor Cutler and Jesse Robbins with to, to set to the instrumental All My Loving is completely pointless, very dreary, not a good sequence. But then the dream sequence was John had a real dream in real life. He had a dream that he was scooping spaghetti onto someone's plate in a restaurant, so he, they just filmed it. They went ahead and filmed it, and it's just one of the George's favourite scene in the movie, probably my favourite, the funniest scene, pure Python-esque humour, with John repeatedly scooping up spaghetti and dumping it onto the plate of Aunt Jessie, and just saying spaghetti, madam, uh, with a straight face, more or less. Uh, <laughs> it's just hilarious. Um, and he's got his hair slicked back like his father uh, used to do used to in the, when his father was younger. Um, the Blue Jay Way sequence is quite interesting visually, but it, it's not my favourite Beatles song, and, it, and it, this video doesn't really rescue the fact that it's quite a dreary song which overstays its welcome. The stripper sequence is interesting with the Bonzo Do Dog Doodah band. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention the Beatles playing cello and running around playing football or throwing footballs around in the Blue Jay way. That's quite amusing. Um, by the way, I guess this whole film is probably better enjoyed if one has taken a substance or two. Because um, if you watch it dead straight in black and white on Boxing Day, you're probably going to think, what the hell is this? Um, but anyway, people can enjoy it in whatever state they want to be in or uh, whatever supplements they want to um, supplement their enjoyment with. Uh, so the stripper sequence is quite interesting. The Bonzo Dog Doodah Band featuring Neil Innes, uh, who later mastermind, one of the masterminds behind the Ruttles, certainly wrote all the tunes. And then one of the highlights of the entire film, you mother should know, with the, the ballroom sequence. And they, they definitely practiced this because there's an outtake of them rehearsing it. And there's some pictures of them rehearsing it there, as I showed you. And it's just wonderful. And I think you can tell that John, they can tell that all four Beatles enjoyed. They may have had, on, at times, they may have slagged off McCartney's uh, songs of this nature, like uh, calling them vaudeville or whatever. But I, they could really, they really enjoyed filming this. You, John's grinning his head off. Uh, as is George and uh, as is Ringo, and Paul is enjoying it, and it's a great scene, and it's a great end to the movie. Uh, the Ruttles were to parody this album, calling it the Tragical History Tour, a self-indulgent TV movie about four Oxford history professors on tour around Rutland tea shops. Um, and as I say, it got slagged off at the time. The album was a success, the EP was a success, and the film TV film has acquired a reputation among the, amongst the public and amongst film directors later, famous film directors, saying that this paved the way for a lot of the uh, the more avant-garde stuff which came later. If, I'm not sure if avant-garde is the right word, but kind of slightly uh, self-homemade feel to it. Um, not so conventional, should we say, in, its, in the way it's made. So a lot to be said for it. Not perfect. Um, 
but a brave attempt to keep to keep pushing the boundaries from the Beatles at this stage in their career. So thank you for watching. See you next time.